Welcome back to another study in the beautiful Gospel of John. Today we're going to be looking at John chapter 8. There are four sections here. The adulterous woman, Jesus, the light of the world, why Jesus is the light of the world, and the truth will set you free. Let's start with the Word of God. Lord, we ask that you as open our eyes to see lessons from this Gospel, from the adulterous woman. Help us see out of darkness that Jesus is the light and why Jesus is the light and we pray that this truth will set us free. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Right, lessons from the adulterous woman. This section of the Bible is missing from all the manuscripts of John before the 5th century. So you only see um, manuscripts, which is the original, uh, which is the, the olden text which we take the Bible from after the 5th century, which is why there's a query whether this actually is the Word of God. The earliest church fathers actually omit this passage when you're actually commenting on John. And the vocabulary and style is unlike that of the rest of the book of John. And it actually interrupts the natural flow from chapter 7 to chapter 8. Because remember, chapter 7 is talking about the festival of the tabernacles, the last day of the, the festival of tabernacles. And then here is the day after the last day. And this bit on chapter 8 the, about the adulterous woman actually interrupts it. So this is some of the reasons why we are not quite clear whether this actually is the Word of God. However, whatever is here doesn't conflict with any doctrine or theology uh, so therefore, it is also in line with the gospel of grace. So therefore, it's worthwhile for us to just have a quick look here. Now, there's a, you have a woman who is brought forward by a couple of the men and they want Jesus to condemn her. But we need to know what the background is in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 22, 22 says, If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both, them, both of them shall die, the man who lays with the woman and the woman. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. But the trouble here in this particular case of prosecution is selective prosecution. Where's the man? How come they just brought the woman? And at that time where Jesus is in the New Testament, stoning was rarely practiced anyway. Why out of the blue, stoning is rarely practiced? Why are they asking Jesus to see whether he wants to have this woman stoned? Well, let's look at verse 3. Uh, verse 3. Scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, placing her in the midst. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in an act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? And this they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his fingers on the ground. See, they are using this law to trap Jesus. They're going to ask Jesus, well, since the Mosaic law is to stone, are you going to agree? If you say, yes, I will stone, the problem is they were under Roman law. In Roman law, capital punishment was reserved by the Roman authority. You could not even apply Jewish law. And when you did that, you don't only lose the sympathy of the crowd, basically you are stoning someone when nobody has been stoned for years and years and years, and you're also usurping. So you'll fall afoul of the sympathy of the crowd, and you also fall afoul of Roman law. If you don't stone her, then you'll be disobeying the, 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 the law of Moses, so therefore you cannot be a Messiah. You can see how they're trying to trap him. What Jesus did was silently wrote on the ground. We don't know what Jesus wrote. Okay, but the Greek word used for what Jesus wrote was katagraphu. Graphu is right, kata is against, which means he must have written an accusation against the people who have brought them, right? And they continued to ask him and he stood up and said to them, he is without sin among you, be the first one to throw a stone. In Deuteronomy it says, the hand of the witness shall be first against him to put to death and afterwards the hand of all the people and you shall purge the evil from your midst. If they wanted to apply this draconian act of stoning a woman, the ones who accused him would have to be the first one to throw the stone. And they knew that this was a setup. This was a setup to trap Jesus Christ and they weren't going to be the ones who throw the first stone, would they? And so therefore, they went away. And Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? 
no one has condemned you? And she says, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now onwards, sin no more. He doesn't condone sin. He applies grace, and he puts out the fact that there is sin. Sin no more. Here is Jesus with sovereign application of grace and obedience. He's asking her to obey. Obedience is a consequence of grace. You don't earn grace through obedience, but because of grace, you obey. The second thing is that Jesus is the light of the world. See, he spoke all these things in the treasury, right? As he taught in the temple. So therefore, when Jesus is speaking, he was speaking um, last time as well in the, temp in the temple when he talked that uh, he, you know, is, the, the, he has living waters. Now in chapter 8, he's still in the treasury. He's taught in the temple and no one arrested him because his hour had not come. And if you look very carefully at the Feast of Tabernacles, this is the day after the Feast of Tabernacles. And the last day, they'd have the huge uh, candelabra all being lit up. Here is all the candles uh, all the candles being, the, the, the lamps being lit up to represent the presence of God as a pillar of fire who led the people of Israel through the wilderness. And here we have the eighth day where all the celebrations are finished and people are taking down the lights, just like Christmas. The day after Christmas, you're taking down all the decorations. Here is a picture of the bright candelabra in the court of the women. And this is the court of the women. This is where the treasury is located. These are where all the big lamps are. And he says to them, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of, the, light of life. Through the darkness of the desert, there is no light. The only light that led the people from the wilderness into salvation is the pillar of fire by night and the cloud of God by day. And when you actually light those candles, you light those lamps, you are actually anticipating the time where God again will lead His people, this time out of Roman rule, out of misery of sin into salvation. And Jesus comes just like the last day where they've got the celebration with the water, where God provides water. Now He comes and says, you know this light? that God had provided during the journey of Exodus, I am this light. In fact, now I am the light, not of Israel, but of the world, the entire world. Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light, my salvation. So light is equal to salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The word of God is the light. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. Right? So, here's a use of metaphor. Darkness is an absence of light. Darkness is lack of knowledge. Light is not only revelation, it is also salvation. Darkness equals evil. Light equals good. In John chapter 1, it says of Jesus, in him was life. And his life was the light of man. As the light shines in the darkness, the darkness could not overcome it. All right? So this is eternal life. Zoe, the quality of eternal life, can only come from Jesus because he's the light of the world. All right? So the light of the world is knowledge and protection of God and life to be lived as it should be. Now, the picture of darkness is hell. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 9 they will suffer the punishment eternal destruction away from the presence of God and from the glory of His might. So therefore, darkness is absence of the presence of God away from His glory. So therefore, what we want to be is in the constant presence of the glory of God. And that's why, why is Jesus the light of the world? Well, Jesus is light of the world because of His relationship with the Father. He comes from the Father to bring the light of knowledge and salvation to people. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. They're objecting. They're thinking Jesus is talking about himself. But Jesus says, he's speaking from a position of perfect knowledge. Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. You know, if any of you out there are talking about yourself alone, then we would say you're boasting. Why? Because you're a human being. For Jesus, it's different. 
Jesus speaks from a position of perfect knowledge, even if I do bear witness about myself. See, if a, if a human being blow, talks about himself, blows his own horn, nobody will believe. But for Jesus, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true because he's the Son of God. For I know where I come from and I know where I'm going, and but you don't know where I'm coming from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Well, not e yet even I do not. If I do, do judge, my judgment is true. It is not I alone who judge, but the Father, I and the Father who sent me. See, human, make, human beings make decisions based on limited human knowledge. You see, you judge according to the flesh. Jesus doesn't evaluate human beings from the normal human perspective. He says, I don't judge anyone. He's, he's not that he doesn't judge anyone. He says he doesn't evaluate people from the normal human perspective. When he evaluates people, when he judges people, it is always true because Jesus and the Father agree. They're in perfect sync. You know, uh, Jack Spong, Episcopalian bishop, modern day Pharisee. Years ago, he wrote this book called Why Christianity Must Change or Die. And he said the reason why churches are actually dwindling in the West is because they're clinging on to outmoded ideas like the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth. Oh, we, we cannot take all, the, all that Christianity talks about in the Bible literally. We must actually change with the times. Uh, Harvey Cox, Harvard Divinity Professor, agrees. P Bishop Spong's work is significant accomplishment. Karen King, Divinity Professor, Divinity Harvard Divinity School, said this book by Shelby Spong, uh, by uh, Jack Spong, should be required reading for everyone concerned with facing uh, head-on intellectual and spiritual challenges of the late 20th century religious life. So therefore, we have to adapt. We've got to get rid of these miracles. We've got to get rid of this Jesus side of God business. We've got to adapt with the times. But that's not true, isn't it? Here's a study by David Millard looking at growing churches and declining churches, what they believe. They put forward the question to them. Jesus rose from the dead with a real life body leaving behind an empty tomb. In growing churches, 90 priests, 90 uh, 3% of the clergy believe of the clergy believe this, and 83% of the laity. In declining churches, 56% of the pastors and clergy believed it, and 67% of the laity. It's very clear. You do not have to change your fundamental beliefs from the Bible that Jesus rose physically from the dead in order to move with the times. The real disciples of God recognize these truths. God performs miracles in answer to prayer. In growing churches, 100% of clergy, 80% of the laity. In declining churches, 44% of the clergy, 80% of the laity. Judge according to human flesh, which means human standards within the dimensions of human experience, with no room for spiritual input. What is happening into liberal churches in the West, and even some affecting our country, is that they have human standards and we judge according to the dimensions of our human experience. There are no miracles. Why? Because I haven't seen one. There's no room for spiritual input, right? Even according to their own criteria, both Jesus and Father are in sync. You see, in Jewish law, you must have two people as witnesses. And here Jesus says, even in your own law, even if we give you what you want, the criteria which you want to evaluate me by, even your own law is written that the testimony two people true. I am the one who bears witness about myself and the Father who sent me. So Father and me plus me is two, isn't it? And they said to him, where's your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would also know my father. The reason why they did not believe is because they don't really have a real relationship with God the Father. And they said to him, who, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true. I declare to the world that what I've heard from him. So he's just saying, I'm telling you what God has told me. And they didn't understand that he was speaking to them about the Father. And then Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of God, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority but speak just as the Father taught me, he who has sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So only the cross, 
only on that last day when you have lifted up. See, when the word lifted up actually means two things. If you look at John chapter 3, it means lifted up the cross and glorified in his sacrifice. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He and I do nothing on my own authority or for my own benefit. I'm doing it for the glory of my Father. And it's true. Mark chapter 15, when Jesus was finally crucified, a Roman centurion, a Gentile, had the faith to see and he stood up facing him and saw this way he breathed his last breath and, and he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. You see, only when Jesus was lifted up and people realized that the reason why he came was to die for their sin. Then they understood that he was the real Messiah. The function of the cross is to reveal the identity of Jesus, even to those who refuse to believe and to be forced to kneel and acknowledge he's exalted on the cross. Why? Because of the beauty of his sacrifice. You will see the beauty there. He's lifted up to return to the glory of God. This is what the cross functions to do. Lastly, the truth will set you free. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And they answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we, you will become free? Well, there's a very famous saying that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In fact, uh, one of the top universities in this world started by Christians. Here's the Harvard Crest, right? which they had in 1692. The original Harvard Crest has the word Christo, which is Christ, and Ecclesia, which is basically the church. And, and, the, and the word in the middle is Veritas, which is in Latin. It's called Truth. Truth for Christ and the church. And if you look very closely at the books here, this book is open, there's a line in the middle. This book is open, there's a line in the middle. And this book is closed. Because... Human knowledge is not exhaustive. You, the people who started Harvest had the humility to understand that what we know as truth is not complete without revelation. The last book is closed because it has got to be revealed to us. Fast forward to the Harvard crest of today and you can see no more Christ, no more church. All three books are with a line in the middle, all three books open, right? Because man is supreme. We know everything. The truth, we know all the truth and the truth will set us free. That's the problem today. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in it, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What he is saying is that if you are obedient to him, if you obey him, then you will show yourself to be true disciples and if you are true disciples, then you will know the truth. And when you know the truth, then only you experience freedom. You come to know the truth not by intellectual assent or studying, but by moral commitment. That is the sequence of events that must happen to us. They answered, well, you know, what are you talking about? We're offspring of Abraham, never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say we will become free? So they disagree that that they, 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 they are not free. They are free. Well, our preference is not possible because what they are saying is that we are free. We use our freedom to know the truth. Then only we become true disciples and then only we be obey. But if you look in the history of the Jews, they are enslaved by Egypt. Northern Kingdom enslaved by Assyria. Southern Kingdom enslaved by Babylon. At the time Jesus spoke, they were enslaved by Rome. They were so full of ethnic pride. And Jesus answered them, Truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. We are all slaves to sin. That's why we cannot know the truth. A slave doesn't remain in the house forever. See, you, 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 you may belong to the big house. If the master has a bad temper and, and, and spots you stealing some money, doing whatever, he'll cast you out. A son remains forever. So therefore, Jesus is saying, if a son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know, Jesus says, I know you are the offspring of Abraham. Yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen in my father and you do what you have heard from your father. 
They are slaves to deception. You see, the whole idea is that Jewish slavery is actually equal to the human slavery. The Jews believe all slaves are king's son, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're sons of the kingdom, right? But they're enslaved to their heritage. They're enslaved to deception. They're enslaved to the devil. They're enslaved to death. John chapter 8, verse 39, 37, 37 to 38. I know you are an offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place. If they were true Jews, they would not be plotting to kill Jesus Christ. You see, if you were truly Abraham's offering, why would you be trying to kill me? I am David's greater son, the Messiah. And they answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said that if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham did. Faith, isn't it? But now you're seeking to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. We have one father, even God. If the Pharisees had truly worshipped God, they would have responded to Jesus. Jesus said to them, if, if, if God were your father, you would love, love me. For I come from the father, I'm here, I, I, you know, I, I, I come not on my own accord, but he sent me. And they are deceived by Satan. The reason why they don't believe is that why don't, why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear my, to hear my words. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He's a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he's a liar and the father of lies. So now he really gives it to them. The reason why they do not believe Jesus Christ is because they are following their father. Like father, like son, isn't it? They are following the father, who the devil, who is the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you don't believe in me, which one of you convicts me of sin? So if you don't believe me, okay, tell me, when have I lied? Tell me in my life, where have I committed fraud? Tell me where I have sinned. If I tell the truth, why do you not believe? Since now he's putting his reputation on lie. There's nobody there who could actually stand up and say Jesus cheated, Jesus did something wrong. There's nobody. Even in Jesus' trial, you can find not a single person. Even Pontius Pilate said this, this man has done nothing wrong. So if Jesus tells the truth, why don't you believe him? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you don't hear them is that you are not of God. What he's saying is plain out. You don't believe simply because you're believing Satan. And that really gets them really upset. And they answered him, are we not right in saying you are Samaritan? I mean, calling someone Samaritan is calling someone a Chinese called Chap Chong. They really denigrate that person. You have a demon. They're saying Jesus is demon possessed. Jesus answered them back. He really tarot them back. He says, I do not have a demon. I honour my father and you dishonour me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. The one who seeks it, there is one who seeks it. And he is the judge. Truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. He's going again. And then they say, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. And he saw it and was glad. How Abraham saw Jesus, I don't know. That's a part of the theology. We're not quite clear. So the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old. How can you say you saw Abraham live thousands of years ago? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, before Abraham was, he said, he didn't say, I was, he says, I am. So they pick up the stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Look at the word. Before Jesus, Abraham was, I am. If you look where this in Greek, ergo eimi, it's the same word in the Greek Old Testament when Moses had an encounter with a burning bush. And there, God said to Moses, when the people ask who sends you, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said to them, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me, ergo, a me. So what Jesus is saying is that, tell them, I am. Jesus is God. Which is why the last verse, they pick up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So here is a huge battle where Jesus really lays it out of the line. He picks out the fact that these people who were the Pharisees, the intellectual uh, elites and the religious elites simply did not believe because they didn't want to believe and they were blinded by the deception of Satan. He confronted them directly. And so therefore, if he's claiming to Messiah, 
they believe that he is not, they pick up stones, they are willing to kill him. And this escalates the battle and it will finally end on the cross. May God add a blessing to his word as you meditate on it.